Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation, Disrupt or Disrupted, Which Will You Be? Presented by UC Berkeley and Henry Chesborough and Andre Marquis. My name is Greg Olson. I'm here with Ivy Exec. I'm going to be helping to moderate the session today. So now I'd like to take this opportunity to briefly introduce our presenters. Professor Chesbro is the author of Open Innovation, Open Business Models, and Open Services Innovation, and founder and faculty director of the UC Berkeley Garwood Center for Corporate Innovation. Andre Marquis is executive director of the Lester Center for Entrepreneurship and the UC Berkeley Center for Executive Education Innovation Acceleration Group. So with that, I'm now going to hand the presentation over to our presenters. Thank you very much, Greg. This is Andre, and uh, great to meet you all this morning. This is uh, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I'm a serial entrepreneur, and uh, I took over running the Entrepreneurship Center in the Business School at Berkeley about five years ago. And what's been interesting is we've completely changed the way we teach entrepreneurs over the past five years. When I got there, and this is what every business school was doing, it was really focused on business plan writing, on how do you teach startups to use the tools of large corporations, writing business plans, doing financials, doing ideation. And we completely changed how we teach really to be about getting out of the building and being an entrepreneur. And then we teach frameworks, business models, those things to really help entrepreneurs go faster. One of the big, um, really intellectual bodies of work that we have at Berkeley is by Henry Chesborough, who uh, I'm, I'm very glad to have on this call with us on open innovation and strategies for making companies go faster and be much more effective in terms of how they generate innovation and test innovation. And it's been very exciting working with Henry to really put these two ideas together. How do you iterate faster like a startup um, and test business models faster, test technologies faster um, while building an open innovation strategy for your company. And I, I don't know if you had any other introductory remarks. I would just also like to welcome everybody to the webinar. Uh, Andre has been the head of our entrepreneurship uh, organization, as he said, for the past five years. Uh, I actually run a center here at Berkeley uh, called the Garwood Center for Corporate Innovation. And one way you can think of us is uh, after the startups grow up, you know, what happens to them then? And with Garwood Center, we provide cradle-to-grave coverage for your, <laughs> all of your innovation needs, whether you're an entrepreneur in a startup or a large company. And in this program that Andre and I are doing together called Corporate Business Model Innovation, we're going to fuse these two worlds, uh, the worlds of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship on the one hand, but also the context of a large company, uh, a prevailing business model that, of course, is tremendously successful, which is how the company became large in the first place, but also exerts its own gravitational force and can suck potential ventures and proposals back into uh, the logic of the dominant business model. So we're going to be playing off of both parts of this uh, in our presentation with you this morning uh, and indeed throughout uh, the course that we're going to be teaching on November 9th, 10th, and 11th. Uh, back to you, Andre. Fantastic. And what's really been exciting over the past few years is working uh, both our Lester Center for Entrepreneurship and Garwood Center together to build programs for corporations that really put the best of these two things together. And so we've had some really exciting programs for people like HP and Caterpillar uh, and Intel. Actually, if you want to see an example of our work, you can go watch the reality TV show America's Greatest Maker by the producers of Shark Tank, um, which we ran the uh, accelerator, and that was really to drive corporate innovation for uh, for Intel. Um, and so, so you can see some examples of that. But, but one of the things I like to talk about is really why is putting together um, the best in open innovation and the best in lean startup uh, important to corporations these days? And, and I really think about two things. This is really a great uh, graph by Michael Felton of the New York Times from 2005. And it shows the pace of technology adoption in the US. And of course, if you go to places like India, um, this graph looks very horizontal. Um, you know, it, um, 
and I mean that in the sense of if you look at smartphone adoption in India and Brazil and places like that, those are essentially vertical lines in terms of the time between when an invention is introduced, which is what the bottom of this graph is, and how long it is until essentially everybody has one. And if you look at something like the iPad, uh, they shipped 50 million iPads in less than four years, and there are about 100 million households in the U.S. So um, this is what startups and companies are both dealing with, which is technology is changing faster than ever. With the internet, of course, we now have instant global distribution and scalability of our IT infrastructure, no matter what kinds of projects we're making. And so there's an opportunity in this world to take advantage of going fast. And the, the people who run the fastest uh, are the ones who make the most money and have the most success. And, and this is another slide I like to talk about how large companies are getting disrupted. And this is looking at the list of Fortune 1000 companies. So if you look at the first line that says 1973 to 1983, one way to think about it is if you look at the Fortune 1000, that's a thousand companies. And if you look at that list in 1973 and you look at that list again in 1983, 350 of the companies are new. So 35% of the companies that were on the Fortune 1000 have dropped off. If you look at that between 2003 and 2013, it's actually 70%. So what we're seeing is not only is the speed of technology increasing, but the speed at which large corporations are disrupted by new entrants, that is to say startups, is going up as well. And so what we've been working on is a way for large companies to have the best of both worlds, have the efficiencies and the scale and the scope and frankly, the profitability of large companies while being able to go faster and innovate at the speed of startups. And that's really our goal with this program is to help you understand the best practices in how to do that. Let me hand it over to Hank to talk about the innovation problems in large companies. Great. So I think one of the things that uh, has animated the work that Andre and I are doing together uh, is the realization that when you try to be innovative in a large company, it's a different context than that facing uh, an entrepreneur with uh, two guys and a dog uh, with their uh, business plan or their PowerPoint going out looking for financing. Uh, on the one hand, uh, companies have enormous resources, uh, large companies, for these possibilities. So you think, my gosh, what a great luxury. Uh, you have all the money you'd ever want. But the truth is large companies are challenged in different ways uh, than entrepreneurs are challenged. Uh, the first two opening sentences of uh, the book I wrote, Open Innovation, back in 2003 are these. Uh, Most innovations fail. Companies that don't innovate die. Uh, that's a very difficult reality for large companies. Uh, our colleague Alex Osterwalder, who is the creator of the business model canvas, uh, has another useful insight that I think helps our course, and that is uh, any company's business model is like yogurt. It's eventually going to become obsolete. And Andre was showing you those Fortune 1000 companies and how they're uh, increasing at a rapid pace. The, the rate of attrition is growing decade to decade. And if you think about the technologies he showed you, getting to very, very large scale faster and faster, you can see why obsolescence is an inevitable for any business model. Yet companies that had do an excellent job scaling and executing their current business model often have a very difficult time trying to search for uh, and then implement a new business model. Uh, and so that's what our course is trying to do, corporate business model innovation is to provide you a framework uh, to guide you through that process. Uh, next slide, Andre. So what we want to help you do in, in the, over the time of our course is think about your innovations and testing and then ways of testing it. I think both Andre and I share a very experimental approach to this innovation where rather than the hippo the most highly important person's personal opinion, H-I-P-P-O, uh, instead of that traditional way of corporate decision making, we really want people to get out and generate data out in the market. Uh, and so in God We Trust, 
all others must bring data. And this is a way we're going to teach you some frameworks to go out of the building, get some data, and bring it back in. Uh, next slide, Andre. Uh, another concept that we're going to bring in is uh, the one that I am the most associated with, which is open innovation. And this is a rather busy chart. But what it's trying to demonstrate is a company's innovation process, which you could think of as this funnel. And in a traditional innovation process, the funnel was rigid and closed. So there was only one way in and only one way out. In the open innovation model, we literally open up the innovation process. And uh, one way you see that here on the slide is drilling holes in the funnel so that ideas and technologies can flow in and out on the journey from the laboratory to the marketplace. So open innovation is actually a very helpful complementary concept for corporate business model innovation. Uh, next slide, Andre. One of the things that open innovation allows you to do, yes, it's a great way to search for new technology, new ideas. It also can help you experiment with new business models. Because with open innovation, if you're practicing it effectively, you're engaged with and collaborating with a number of other organizations outside your own four walls. And in those discussions and, and collaborations, you can often harness the outputs of what some of your partners have already achieved and already demonstrated. And in a sense, you can start in the middle. You don't have to go all the way back to the very beginning of generating that initial uh, possibility or that initial option. It's already there. And you're, by through the collaborations you're doing, you're getting access to it. So by starting in the middle, you can go faster. The cost can actually be lower because you still have to take it the rest of the distance, but you don't have to start from the beginning and go through the blind alleys, uh, the dead ends that whoever did initially uh, often did have to go through that. Um, so this is a great way to, to speed things up. Uh, another thing I like about this is you can often use other people's money using open innovation. And, and by that I mean uh, venture capitalists like to syndicate their investments so that even if they've got a great company that they're very excited about, they will often invite other professional investors into the investing syndicate to get more eyes on the problem and, and to get more capital uh, to work on it. And at the same time, that allows their own capital to go farther. They can invest in more deals, more ventures, by syndicating with other VCs. Uh, there's a similar concept here with open innovation. If you are collaborating with other companies uh, and utilizing some of what they are doing as well as what you are doing, uh, you can actually make your dollars go farther. Um, and the, the final thing that open innovation can do, particularly at early stages, uh, is one of the tenets of our course is to get out of the building and test your ideas out with real prospective customers early in your thinking. Uh, this thinking extends in open innovation to then the implementation and execution of your idea. For example, in most large companies, their sales force won't let you go out of the building to talk to customers, at least not without them there. So you need to have ways to access and engage with people without running directly into your own sales organization. And so open innovation through these collaborations can help you uh, utilize other people's sales forces or other people's connections uh, to start the process uh, while you're still at a small scale uh, before you want to go and eventually, of course, if things go well, you will want to engage your sales force, but you want to wait until the right moment to do that when you've got real data, real evidence, uh, and you can really show the opportunity uh, to your company. So in the early stages, open innovation and collaboration with external parties can reduce some of the internal friction that you might otherwise encounter. Uh, Andre, back to you. Thank you. So one of the things that it has been very interesting to me since I spent much of my career being an entrepreneur and working with startups is um, the notion of testing ideas. One of the things I tell entrepreneurs all the time is don't quit your day job uh, until you've raised money. And the goal behind saying that is don't jump in uh, until you've reduced as much risk as possible. And one way to think about that is that as a species, 
human beings are terrible at picking winners. And uh, I could do a whole one hour webinar on this, but let me just give you some, some, you know, a few data points. Just take Silicon Valley, right? We've got a great economy, you know, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, we've got Google, we have all these successes. But if you look across the data, about 70% of venture capital investments fail. So, meaning they never return the amount of money that the venture capital firm invested. What's interesting about that is venture capital is typically invested later. So that's not invested really at the idea stage. That's the friends and family money. That's angel capital. That's the stuff that's invested early. So the failure rates of that are even higher. If you look at, say, the pharmaceutical industry, a drug that generates positive preclinical data in animals has somewhere between a 3 and 5% chance of ever being marketed. Even when you go over to things like consumer products, take the food industry, about 80% of launched consumer packaged goods products never return the capital invested to them. So when I look at the innovation process, and I certainly believe that innovation is a business process or a set of business processes, um, you have to start with the assumption that you can't pick winners. So running an idea competition where you have all your employees submit their best ideas, and then you have a panel of your top executives, and they pick the best ideas and uh, invest in those, you know, the top five ideas out of the 500 ideas are employees submitted. Um, those are doomed to failure. Um, we, when I got to Berkeley, and again, this is the same with almost every other business school, we had an incubator and we had 12 teams in it. Uh, and we would certainly have our successes out of our incubator, um, thanks to our great Berkeley students and our Silicon Valley ecosystem, but we really weren't generating a lot of winners. So, so we went back to square one and said, well, how can we really test more ideas, build an ecosystem where instead of testing 12 ideas a year, we're testing hundreds. And through adopting this philosophy, we uh, have brought things to Berkeley like the National Science Foundation Innovation Core. So this is a program we run for the National Science Foundation. We take laboratory investigators, so people who run laboratories, you know, the, the, the scientists, scientists, and their graduate students, and we run them through uh, an eight-week program. And they go out, they have a business model canvas, they do 100 customer interviews in eight weeks, and they talk to customers, they talk to users, they talk to payers, they talk to partners. They really try to understand is their technology or their business idea solving an important problem for customers, a problem that's important enough for customers to change their behavior. Because that's one of the biggest problems when you look at the pace of technology disruption is consumers are constantly changing their behavior. So we used to look phone numbers up in the yellow pages and then we use Google and now we're on our smartphones. And so for people in the business of selling advertising for small companies, they've had to pivot and pivot and pivot their business models. And certainly you see, um, well, I mean, I, I, I'd love to know how many of you actually have looked in the yellow pages in the last six months. <laughs> Paper <laughs> book. Um, probably not many of you. Um, and uh, uh, I actually have a friend whose father made his fortune selling the yellow pages, but his father had to retire early. I'll put it that way. So, um, but but if, you, if you believe fundamentally that we cannot pick winners, and like I said, you can look across any industry that that is the case. Then you have to run your innovation process in a way that tests lots of ideas. And for us, in terms of how we do this for entrepreneurs and for corporations, that's really been the big paradigm shift. And so if you look at Steve Blank's Lean Launchpad class, um, and, and Steve Blank, has taught at Berkeley for 12 years. Um, this is really where he developed this notion of customer development. That framework's been adopted by the US National Science Foundation. It's been adopted by the US National Institutes of Health. Uh, it's being adopted by our departments of energy and they just tried it with our department of defense. So that 
represents about $70 billion in research investment in the United States, where really the first attempt to validate the commercialization opportunity for these ideas is through this get out of the building, lean uh, startup experience. Um, and that's led to much higher success rates. So uh, teams that have been through the National Science Foundation process have basically more than tripled their rate of funding, meaning when they get in front of potential investors, be that the government with commercialization funding or angel or venture capital investors, essentially they have a lot of data. They've been out of the building, they've collected data from customers, they understand their business much better, they've built a network of potential partners and customers, and that's what they come to investors with as opposed to uh, a written business plan. And we've been able to build a methodology that scales to hundreds of teams at a time. And I think that's another key uh, insight is if you want to test a lot of ideas, you actually have to build a repeatable business process. Um, and that's something else we'll talk about. You can learn more about these materials if, if, um, if you um, go to say Steve Blank's website or you talk uh, type National Science Foundation Innovation Corps into Google. Um, in fact, there's a great website by VentureWell, which is a nonprofit in Massachusetts, and they have the full curriculum um, and videos and things like that if you're interested in learning more about the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps. Again, that's VentureWell, um, and, and you can find out about that. And if you look at this diagram I have up on the screen, that's really, that's customer discovery. That is the process that Steve Blank invested, and that's really about getting out of the building and uh, talking to customers. After you've done that, there's really a second process, which is validating whether customers will buy and, and can you really get to the kind of scale that either if you're a startup, a venture capital investor, or if you're a corporation, your existing investment committees um, have enough data and they're willing to invest in that idea. And that's, that's typically a six to nine month process with your minimum viable product, with um, uh, direct customer testing, testing the marketplace, those things. But, you know, to, to to uh, Henry's point about, you know, everyone else has to bring data, that really is a big paradigm shift in terms of innovation is these structured business processes, structured educational experiences, and structured frameworks to generate data around business models and business model scalability. So it's not someone's individual idea uh, of what this is, but um, really a process that you can run over and over again and across hundreds of teams. And, and Andre, let, let me make one quick comment here, if I may. You mentioned this in passing, but I just wanted to underline this because it got me very excited when I saw it. Uh, the Small Business Administration runs a, a program called the Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR, uh, grants. And their typical acceptance rate for a first phase grant uh, is around, as I understand it, about 18%. That's correct. One eighth. Yep. Uh, when the i teams, one cohort of them, uh, applied for to the SBA for follow-on grant research, my understanding is their success rate was right around 60%, or as you were That's saying, correct. more than three times the success rate. So that's a pretty good apples to apples comparison of before and after uh, normal venture startups applying to the Small Business Administration versus i graduates uh, applying. And then the last time Andre and I did this course, uh, we had uh, somebody from General Mills uh, sharing some of their experience with us uh, with something uh, they were doing uh, to test that they called lemonade stands. And one of the things that the, he, they told us is that uh, in their, they launch lots and lots of new products every year. As Andre said, most of the new products don't succeed. They, they have a very high failure rate. What the General Mills people told us was for, for the new product introductions that had a significant open innovation component to the introduction, 
their first 12 months of revenue were more than 100% higher than the in new product introductions that did not have a significant open innovation element. And their explanation of this was that with the open innovation uh, collaborations and enhancements, they were either a more differentiated product in the market, and that boosted their sales substantially, and or they were able to get to the market faster because of the collaborations and really hit the market window more effectively, and that also helped sales. So I think there's a really nice combination of these things uh, through the i methodology on the one hand, through the open innovation approach as well, uh, that can really offer some uh, exciting possibilities for companies. Well, and to, to build on your example, um, one of the things that to me was most interesting about the lemonade stand model and certainly showed the, the boldness of this initiative is the teams that were working in the lemonade stand concept were directly creating the product ideas themselves, building prototypes, and this is food, um, uh, and so, you know, yogurt with granola, they had a bunch of great examples, and then going out and selling that directly to customers in stores. Yeah, which, that's the lemonade stand, yeah. That's the lemonade stand, and, and yeah. that's a really bold idea because you think, you know, for decades we've been talking about empowering employees in large companies, and to me that is the most direct example of truly empowering employees, like really creating a culture change, which is as a small team, you have the ability to innovate in a product concept, go out there and put it out in the market and feel, and I will say this, all the either adulation or disappointment of exactly what your customers are telling <laughs> you to your face about your product. Um, and that really is a theme um, around this disruptive change is because we live in a world where you can do 3D printing, you can, you know, um, I know in the lemonade stand example, they would just outsource packaging. So they would create packaging very quickly to um, just very quickly represent the brand so they could get something in front of customers. Um, that was something these small teams did. Interestingly enough, a, another example that I was lucky enough to be part of was at Eli Lilly, which is the world, roughly the world's eighth largest pharmaceutical company. They make Prozac and um, medicines you've heard of. And we created a business unit about 10 years ago that um, did drug development as a lean startup inside a large corporation. And, and it's a longer story about how we got there because like most startups, that was not the idea we started with. We started with a completely different idea, figured out that our customer, AKA our bosses at Eli Lilly, really, really did not care about our initial concept. And so we had to pivot um, within Eli Lilly uh, to do drug development, but we created a minimum viable product using positron emission tomography, which lets you test a very small amount of drug in patients with limited FDA approval, because you're only putting about a picogram of drug into people. But with that minimum viable product, we were able to create experiments that tested real pharmaceuticals that Eli Lilly was interested in bringing to market, uh, put those in human patients, get data, interpret that data, and make recommendations about whether um, to move those drugs forward in the development process. And Eli Lilly has actually scaled Chorus to 59 people, um, if you read their last annual report. And Chorus now runs around half of their phase one and phase two drug development pipeline. So this is a, a company that has over 30,000 employees and this small group of less than 60 people is running really the part of their drug development pipeline that is about reducing risk, about testing, you know, if you have a new mechanism of action for a drug, a new market opportunity, that is something you put into Chorus because Chorus can run experiments very inexpensively because you're using a small team. And of course, the other half of the drugs that Eli Lilly is developing is going through their traditional process. And this is something we see more and more is that for the, the 
testing new business models, for testing new technologies, you need a lean process where you can run experiments quickly, get right there in front of the customer just like the lemonade stand, um, get direct feedback, not spend a lot of money, not spend a lot of time, and for your existing products that are profitable, you want to add features to them, you want to put products into your existing channel that are for your existing customers, you use the traditional process because that is a very profitable process. And so, so one of the things that's been very interesting about this journey is really this notion that, you know, the it's not to say the existing process doesn't work because look at all of the very profitable companies we see around the world delivering great things. You know, I can hold up my iPhone and say, look, here's a large company delivering something that I love and making a lot of money doing it, I might add. Um, and so you don't want to disrupt that, but larger companies in order to adapt at the speed of startups need to develop new processes. And, and that's a lot of what we're focusing on um, both in this uh, seminar we're running in November and in our work with other companies. We just finished up a program for one of the world's largest computer manufacturers and, and, and one of the best things uh, one of the team members said that went through this program of testing new business opportunities in the uh, computing space was he said, you know what, my VP is now demanding that every product we invest more than a million dollars in go through this validation process. We want direct feedback from customers. We want to understand what customer segments get value out of this. Um, and all of that data that we collect almost as a little startup within the corporation, that goes in front of our senior corporate committee because then they can make a better decision about what's strategic for our company. And I think that's a, an incredible synthesis of both of these uh, ideas. Um, let me hand over the next slide to you, Hank, um, to, to talk a little bit more about looking across all the topics in this disruptive marketplace. Yeah, so I th hopefully by this time in the webinar, if you're still with us, uh, you get the idea that there's something important to understand about how to do business model innovation in a larger corporation. So let's get more specific about what is it we're going to cover in the course. Uh, and here's a good list of the topics uh, that inform the design of our course and what you will experience in the course. Uh, as we've already discussed, we will talk it, at, in detail both about open innovation and about the challenges of business model innovation. Uh, we do use heavily Alex Osterwalder's business model canvas, uh, and then we also talk about using it inside a large company uh, and helping to understand not only your, the large company's current business model, but then comparing your venture and its potential business model to this established business model and sort of overlaying one on top of the other. So that's, I think, something else that's uh, helpful in this course. Uh, we will acquaint you very much with Lean Startup uh, with uh, Steve Blank and Eric Reese uh, and their ideas about getting out of the building and getting that initial validation from real customers out in the market. Uh, one thing that Andre and I both bring to this is that uh, although we've been in startups, Andre and I have also both worked in large companies for some years. Uh, Andre's already mentioned Eli Lilly. I worked in a hard disk drive company called Quantum Corporation for more than seven years as an employee and another five as a consultant. So we actually both have some scar tissue from the large company context as well, and I think that informs some of what we're doing here. Uh, and this, I think, is evidenced in the next point that it isn't only about, in, in a large company, it isn't only about being a startup. You've got internal power and politics issues you've got to face up to. All of those wonderful resources that the large company has come with an agenda. Uh, and every one of the managers responsible for the sales organization, responsible for quality, responsible for the brand, uh, responsible for procurement, all of these groups uh, can block you if you don't have uh, some ways of thinking about how to work with them or if you adopt some of the open innovation techniques you can perhaps work around them at least in the early going but you've got to think about the internal power and politics issues to make this work inside a large company and I have tremendous respect for both Eric Reese and Steve Blank, but this is an area where, in my judgment, they don't do enough. I think they, they, they skip over this, uh, and they don't realize how hard it can be in a large company if you don't pay attention to these issues. 
Uh, then we get to, all right, if you've got your venture idea and the business model canvas for your idea and you've thought about uh, getting out to the customers and you've also thought about inside your own building, uh, go, getting upstairs in the building to get that support internally, how do you build and test uh, a go-to-market strategy in a lean way? Uh, and then uh, if you do this and it looks like it goes well, how do you bring it back? How do you integrate it back into the larger company? So these are the topics that we cover uh, over the arc of the course. Uh, next slide, Andre. And what this uh, means for you is uh, these are the things that you can expect to walk away with, the deliverables that you will take away with from attending uh, the course and, of course, doing all the hard work we're going to make you do during the course. Uh, we do want you to come in with some idea. Uh, as Andre's already mentioned, uh, the idea might change. You, there, there's a term called pivot where you actually, in response to feedback, you actually change or adapt what you're thinking. Uh, and in this course, uh, we don't have you for eight weeks, ten weeks. We've only got you for three days. But you will have, over the course of that time, a chance to really test your idea uh, in a supportive but challenging environment. Uh, you'll be challenged by us as instructors, you'll also be challenged by your fellow students who themselves are doing the same kinds of things. Uh, we will go into some detail about some of the barriers that an internal venture uh, can expect to face in a large company and, we, and you in, in turn will be generating your own list of barriers and one of the things that's fun for Andre and me is that uh, even though every company has a, a unique culture and its own challenges, it's remarkable how similar many of these are from very different industries, very different companies, and yet many of the internal barriers are quite similar. We will share with you some examples, uh, some success stories. Uh, we mentioned General Mills from our last class. Uh, we have an example from a, a Spanish telco called Telefonica that to share with you. Uh, I've also invited the former CEO of Clorox, uh, another consumer packaged goods company, who's had some success here to share with you. So you will hear from some uh, examples of companies that have done it, and you'll have the opportunity to ask them directly, uh, you know, <laughs> what did you do, how did you deal with this, how did you overcome that, and so on. Uh, we will provide a number of tools and frameworks uh, to assist you through this process that you can take back to your organization and put to work uh, in your own companies. And by the end of the, the day, on the third day, you will have developed and presented uh, a plan or a proposal that you can take back on Monday morning uh, and bring to your own management's attention. So these are some of the deliverables that you will you can take away from what we're doing. Fantastic. And then I'll speak to this as just you know why is Berkeley a, a great place for this? And 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 first of all, to to uh, to Hank's credit, he is the he is the father of open innovation. And for those of you who, who don't know a lot about it, um, I will just say this. GE has a center for open innovation. Novartis has a center for open innovation. Uh, I was down in Brazil meeting with one of the largest um, manufacturers of underwater drilling equipment. And I met their director of open innovation. Um, the, the impact that his work has had uh, over these prior decades on how companies think about their strategy and embrace all these disruptive changes can't be be underestimated. Uh, Hank doesn't always toot his own horn, but I'm going to toot his horn, and and I highly recommend his books. He, um, he has uh, he's written a number of them. The 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 the, the greatest uh, hits of all kinds of different business models. Oops. Um, and uh, his open innovation book, open services innovation. Um, he has a, he has a great book. Uh, he just recently published with case studies, and, and I can recommend all of it. Um, also, we're ground zero for the National Science Foundation Innovation Core. Um, we ran the first National Institutes of Health Innovation Core program. Again, Steve Blank has been on our faculty for 12 years, and it's really put lean startup into the DNA of Berkeley. And um, we train dozens and dozens of companies and universities around the world, and, and that has really helped us build a program. I think this year we'll run training in more than 20 countries. You can see programs we've run, for example, for the Prime Minister of in India, Innovate for Digital India, which is a program around social ventures um, and uh, helping the poor. Uh, we do this for large corporations, and so really have that breadth of knowledge about how you apply both open innovation 
and lean startup across almost every discipline. We have experience from food service to um, nanotechnology. Um, and because we have scaled our own infrastructure to deliver lean startup training to more than a thousand startups, again, in more than 20 countries, we understand this notion of building scale. And again, it, and one of the things I'm passionate about is, is if you talk to people and say, well, we're bad at picking winners, um, and they say, yes, yes, they totally believe all kinds of data. Tell me about your innovation process. Well, we have an incubator and we pick the top four teams with this, or we have an idea competition and our senior managers pick the best ideas for development. And I think to myself, now wait, there's a fundamental disconnect between that belief that none of us can pick winners and the innovation process you're running, and it's no shock that you're not generating uh, business model disruption out of the process you're running because you're not embracing some of the core concepts. And when I look at the change we've been able to drive, for example, at Berkeley, now really across our entire campus, everything is about lean startup, lean testing, getting out of the building, iterating and pivoting in a way it wasn't just three years ago. Um, and I call it culture change because many of these things have nothing to do with me, uh, <laughs> who, uh, who pushed really to, to work with Steve Blank and scale what he did out of the classroom. And to me, that's the definition of culture change. Uh, and I think having a lot of people do this is what generates culture change. Of course, we're part of Silicon Valley. More than half our alumni are in Silicon Valley. If you look at the top technology company CEOs, more of them graduated from Berkeley than any other university. And of course, we're very excited to, to be the world's number one public university. Um, and uh, um, you know, it's nice to have Nobel Prize winners in the building we get to bump into in the hall, um, but really it's much bigger than that. It's really um, being at the epicenter of innovation and having great science, great technology, great arts, um, and bringing a really set of brilliant people together that we can bring into the classroom uh, and share ideas with you. So, Hank, why don't I hand it to you to, to wrap it up? So the uh, opportunity we have is uh, this executive course called Corporate Business Model Innovation uh, to be held in November from the 9th through the 11th uh, here in beautiful Berkeley, California. Uh, early November uh, is a delightful time to be here. Sadly, we uh, seem to be still in the midst of a drought, so we won't likely have much rain, and so we'll just have beautiful sunshine instead. Um, <laughs> And we very much uh, look forward uh, to seeing many of you at the course. Um, we've, the course has done well with previous participants. Um, in fact, one of the cases we're going to share with you came from a group that went through the course uh, two years ago. Uh, so, uh, and we ha have high hopes that uh, one or more of you will do great things that we can continue to use to teach uh, in future sessions as well. Um, and I think we do have a unique perspective, uh, both in combining open innovation with Lean Startup and uh, bringing entrepreneurship from the uh, three guys and a dog to entrepreneurship inside uh, a large corporation and, the, and the, both the opportunities and the challenges that that presents. Uh, so with that, let's uh, take uh, your thoughts and questions and the time that we have remaining. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, so we'd like to start with this question. Uh, we're seeing a lot of companies that are almost in a foot race to be first to market with a, a new disruptive technology or product, and, you know, be it uh, self-driving cars or smartwatches or wearables, uh, just as an example. Uh, the question is, is it better to be the first entrant or one of the earliest into a new market but not have the best technology or is it better to be uh, a later entrant with superior technology? So Andre, I'll start and you can add on to add your thoughts. The way that I would frame this is it's best to be first with a good business model. Uh, your question was framed around the technology and that's a very common way people come at this. Uh, but if you think about Google, it was the 18th search engine into the market, but it was really the first one to develop uh, an AdWord auction mechanism combined with the page rank uh, algorithm to sequence the display of results so that you got relevant ads. 
uh, on an auction basis. And no other search engine company had done that prior to Google doing it. Uh, speaking of Google and autonomous cars, why is a search company involved in autonomous cars in the first place? From a technological standpoint, it's hard to see a direct connection. But once you think about the business model, the connection be, to me becomes quite obvious. If indeed we can take our hands off the wheel and be sitting in our cars on the commute here on Route 101, which unfortunately is something of a parking lot at rush hour, what are we going to be doing with our time in those autonomous vehicles? Many of us are going to be online searching. Google knows exactly how to monetize the time we spend online searching. So anything that increases the amount of time we spend online is money that directly in Google's pocket and expands Google's market. So we really think that uh, it's not about finding the best technology. It's finding a good enough technology that a real customer will pay real money for and then the business model that allows you to capture enough value from that interaction to, to build and scale from there. And, and just to build on that, I, I agree 100%. And that is really what I think people need to think about as disruptions come. Facebook, of course, is another classic example. There were plenty of social networks before Facebook. They built for an audience of college students who are the ones who were going online most rapidly and built a much bigger network, you know, blowing by FriendFinder and MySpace and, um, and other people. And so it really wasn't about the technology, it was about the business model, the customer segments, the value propositions, um, and, and, and we see example after example of this. Fantastic. Um, next question we have is which industries um, do you see being disrupted the most in the coming years? And uh, additionally, we have a question, are there certain industries that can benefit most from uh, the CBMI course? So again, Andre, I'll start and you, you add on. Um, we will deliberately look at both business to business situations and business to consumer situations as well uh, in the course. I think both Andre and I feel that uh, very few, if any, industries can be complacent uh, about their ability to uh, avoid disruption or avoid these forces that Andre let, started with in our presentation. Remember all those for new Fortune 1000 companies, 70% uh, were new within the last decade of time. So that means 70% of the old ones dropped out uh, because of being overtaken. So it's not a phenomenon in one industry uh, or one sector of the economy. I think it's pretty pervasive. And the smarter approach for most companies uh, is to plan on uh, being threatened by these things and to institute uh, responses and innovation processes now uh, that will allow the company to, to better stay on top of this and perhaps even participate in some of these disruptive activities using these lean processes that can generate data before there are large markets, before there are market research surveys uh, and research organizations telling you how big the market is, which means a whole bunch of other companies already did this because that's what the market research firms are studying. Yeah, and I, I think by the time things make it into analyst reports, it's too late. And just to give you examples, um, uh, we look at the food industry, you know, 80% of new brands are created by startups. Uh, actually, in uh, the last time we ran this course, uh, the phrase chobanied was um, added <laughs> around, which uh, I don't know if those of you those of you have had chobani Greek yogurt, but that became a multi-billion dollar brand as a startup um, and, and was eventually bought by a larger company, but for quite a bit of money when, you know, I'm sure they were asking themselves, now wait a minute, making Greek yogurt and putting it in a container and putting it on the, the shelves of the stores we're already putting yogurt in every day, how hard could that have been? And, and that's not really the point. So we look at food, uh, you look at the automobile industry with people like Tesla, you look at the energy industry with batteries and solar cells and new technologies that are not being run by the, the oil companies. I mean, you look across classic technology businesses, cloud computing, 
online marketing services. So really time after time after time, I, I have yet to see an industry that is not being disrupted. And I think that, that was one of the reasons I showed that slide about the Fortune 1000 there at the beginning, because um, a lot of times people like to think that um, their industry is not gonna be disrupted because they understand their industry well. And one of the things that's really good to look at is go, you know, go onto Google or Bing or your favorite search engine site and look at um, Blackberry's stock price when the iPhone was introduced. So go all the way back to 2007 and look at when the iPhone was introduced. And what you will notice about their stock price is it kept going up for months and months and months well after the iPhone was out there. Uh, and I think that is a classic mistake that large companies make is it's like, our, we're here for shareholder value, our stock is doing great, um, we're good. And you know your doom is already sealed. And you see, we'll, we'll, we'll share a bunch of examples of that in the course as well, and hopefully uh, give you some things to watch out for as you look at the business model of your own company. And, and perhaps could you elaborate on that uh, a little bit more? Like, it, it does seem that there are these massive companies, such as, you know, classic example would be Blockbuster, for example, that see disruption happening in their industry and still fail to react. What do you think that comes down to? So uh, I, my thought on this is that uh, Andre was mentioning the stock price of uh, a company like Nokia continuing to prosper for many, many months uh, after what we now know was an existential threat uh, entering their business. I think this is due to uh, what I think of as the gravitational force of your existing business model, or if you prefer, the inertia of the existing business model. Uh, when you are talking to the analysts on Wall Street, you are telling them a story about your company and you are trying to guide the analysts and how to value the company's prospects going forward. And so there's a whole story about how the company uh, takes its opportunities and converts them into value for the shareholder. Uh, and in the case of Nokia, I'm sure this had to do with things like how many users they have, how big the markets are and how fast they're growing, et cetera. And these things all continue to trend upward uh, even after the iPhone came in. Uh, where the disruption takes place, of course, is the value proposition of the iPhone was radically different than the value proposition of the Nokia phone. Uh, and that only became apparent to Nokia you know, long after the fact, and therefore only later did the, the markets catch up with that. So using this business model framework, I think, can really focus your attention on your customer on your customers' needs, the customers' jobs to be done, uh, ways of improving and strengthening your value proposition if you want to be the disruptor, and ways of collecting experimental data to find out whether disruption is really a problem for you or not. Uh, the data will be out there. The customers will tell you uh, if you get the right set of discussions, the right kinds of prototypes to interact with the customers, you can unlock uh, this repository of data uh, be way before the analysts get it. Uh, so we, we both, Andre and I, believe this is something that can and should be uh, experimented with uh, and through the data generated by the experiments, you can then make much more uh, effective predictions about your future. And that's why you have to build a business process that's continuously testing. This is the challenge for large corporations. They're already being disrupted. And what they haven't responded with is an effective set of business processes to, um, to generate innovation and, and test for these business model disruptions. Just to give you an analogy, if you think of the financial system of a large corporation, so you know everything from generating quarterly reports to reimbursing financial, um, you know, for reimbursing you for your expenses. Um, Corporations are running a very elaborate business process. It generates a lot of value for the company, right? It helps them save money. Uh, they generate a lot of data so they can make effective decisions. But it's a very elaborate process and it's taken, what, 100 years roughly. I think there's a, there's a great book on uh, A&P supermarkets and talking about how they built a system for 
doing reporting, of course it was all on paper back in the days of, of a and in the, the, the earlier part of the 20th century, um, but so that their senior managers could make decisions about what stores were performing, what stores weren't performing, what products were selling, what products were working. But, but remember at that time that was a huge innovation about gathering data for decision making at the top level. Uh, and we really have to look at innovation the same way as people need to build scalable innovation processes that are generating data that managers can evaluate in order to make resource allocation and strategic decisions. And to me, that's the paradigm shift that's really being uh, driven um, within the best companies and the companies are experimenting with is how can you have an innovation process that lets you look at you know the the balance sheet and cash flow statement equivalent of your innovation portfolio and see if you are actually addressing significant problems uh, at a fast enough rate and this really ties back to um, uh, what Henry just talked about which is companies get disrupted without even knowing it um, and that's because they're not gathering enough data and they're not running enough experiments to really be on top of the changes in the market. And that stuff is not bubbling up to the senior management. And so startups are more than happy to take that money from them. <laughs> that's my point of view on this. Great. Uh, I have a, a, a comment from the audience that, you know, disruptive technologies are clearly we're seeing a trend that they're leading to job loss in certain places. You know, what does this mean for companies and even on a greater scale, the economy, um, how, would, how do they cope? So I'm, part of that question was about jobs in the economy and part of that was about how companies cope. Uh, the second part I think we've answered. We think the companies need to build innovation processes that can experiment, that allow them to sort of sense changes in the environment early on. So you have sort of an early warning system and a set of processes to develop responses uh, in the form of new potential ventures that get validated in the market. So the second part of that I think we've addressed pretty thoroughly. Uh, the first part of that is a, a difficult challenge. Uh, I think the way that work is organized uh, is changing in this environment. We haven't yet talked about the collaborative or sharing economy. But with the, with the Ubers, the Airbnbs of the world, uh, we are seeing platforms where things are completely digital uh, and the assets uh, are held uh, differently, not by the company doing the connecting. And the kinds of jobs that are available, the kinds of careers that will be available, I think are also in flux. So these are things that I think that are going to be challenges for societies going forward. Great, thanks. Um, I have one more question here. There's an assumption that managers uh, value data, but a number of mature companies continue to value intuition and gut. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And also, is there a discussion in your course on this issue? So yes, there is a discussion of it. Um, I mentioned earlier the hippo, the highly important person's personal opinion. Um, that is indeed the gut intuition. And uh, uh, again, Andre will add his two cents here, but my, my own belief is that uh, companies, particularly senior leadership's intuition is actually often very good in the core businesses that they have. Uh, and that does indeed allow them to make uh, better, quicker decisions and maybe more innovative uh, approaches as well because of the intuition they've honed. But when we're talking about new ventures in a peripheral area far from the core and potentially a very different business model to how, for how to make money out of that, uh, the intuition breaks down because it isn't informed by the earlier experiences and the pattern recognition that's developed over time in the core business. And that, in this sense, data is even more critical precisely because you're way outside the area where your intuition can really help you. And that's something we're going to talk about in the course a lot because um, if you look at the experience I had at starting Chorus at Eli Lilly, so that was the, the group that now runs about half of Eli Lilly's phase one and phase two drug development pipeline, a lot of what we worked on was generating data around our core business that was that they Lilly could compare in terms of cost, cycle time, um, probability of success, what was the probability uh, that a product was going to get to market, what was the profitability, potential profitability of these products. Um, we spent a lot of time building uh, information systems and generating that data for 
um, the senior management of the company, knowing that was critically important. And interestingly enough, that's been our approach with startups in extending beyond uh, Steve Blank and the Lean Launchpad is uh, we have a number of programs that come after that core Lean Launchpad, do 100 customer interviews, understand the business model canvas exercise that are focused essentially completely on figuring out what your strategic metrics are. Um, in the case of if you're a startup, it's for venture capital investors, for understanding your lifetime value of customer, customer acquisition costs, cycle time, product usage, product stickiness, all of these things. Um, I, I, you know, I won't go through all of it here because we don't have time, but, um, and, and then applying that to a corporate context. So matching how your senior managers are making decisions and the kinds of metrics they're looking at with the kind of data you can generate out of these lean experiments. And, th and that's a very exciting area of innovation right now. And I will just echo something Henry said, which is the reason managers go with their gut is because they don't have data. So what we have noticed is that when people have data and they understand the experiments that are being run, um, that generates new experiments, new data, and so it becomes a dialogue about acquiring data and testing and what's lacking in most innovation processes is exactly that is there's um you know there's some testing but there's not really a basis of evolving and building deeper data and continuing the validation in a way that senior managers understand and that's that's something we're absolutely going to talk about in this program because that's critical to scaling innovation within a large organization Wonderful. Well, we are about out of time. I want to give a big thanks to everybody for joining us today and uh, for offering all those wonderful questions. And a, a big shout out, thank you to Andre Marquis and Henry Chesborough and UC Berkeley. Before we wrap up the session, any uh, final thoughts you would like to leave the audience with? Well, well thank you I'll all for this. your attention. Yeah, thank you for paying attention. And and. To me, this is really an incredibly exciting time to work at large corporations because, because disruption is coming more quickly, everybody recognizes this. Every CEO of a large company that I've talked to understands it's a challenge. Uh, and as someone who uh, works at a large organization myself, that is to say the University of California, Berkeley, I know that um, helping to solve this problem for our senior management is something that they really value and they're looking for ways forward. Uh, and to, so to work on these uh, breakthroughs is, is really just an exciting area to be involved in and I encourage you all to, to learn further about it.